hi, everybody. <laughs> it is so good to have you here. I'm always happy to be with you today. And we're going to have a good conversation. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, so let's just relax and let's have a little fun together. This is a time for you to really ask me any questions that you have or tell me what's working well, tell me what's not working so well so that we can hear from you. Your voices are critically important. And I always scoff at anybody who says, well, you know, the kids, they're just kids. What do they know? No, our kids know a lot. You know a lot. You're living it every day. You're intelligent, you're smart, and you have really, really good advice. And much of what you tell me and what you tell our team, we use what you tell us so that we can make our system better. So don't hold back today, and let's just have a really good conversation. Let's see who we have here first. Our sixth graders, raise your hand. Where are you? Let's give our sixth graders a round of applause. Good job. Seventh grade, where are you? All right. Lots of seventh graders. Eighth grade. Whoa. Eighth graders, you're getting ready. Are you ready? You're getting ready for high school? All right, so you're ramping up. I also want to take some time to thank your administrators, your teachers, your counselors, your department chairman, who are here, who have coached you kind of along the way and who are chaperoning today. So let's have all of our teachers, administrators raise your hand. Let's give them a round of applause. They work hard for you every day. This is a service to you and they serve our children and our community. So to, from me to you, thank you for what you do, uh, because sometimes it doesn't get said, and so we need to make sure that we're acknowledging all of your hard work. So thank you for that. Let me just tell you a little bit about where we are, and then as a, as a jumping off point, and then we're going to kind of alternate sides as you raise your hand to ask your question or to give me a suggestion, because we're open to that as well. So for Baltimore County Public Schools, I think you, you know, everybody knows kind of our focus area, literacy and school climate, right? And I'm sure that you've heard that, and which is a good thing. This is not just, you're just about reading and writing. Reading and writing is important, but you have to read. Your, it's about reading and writing and listening, speaking, thinking across every discipline and in every subject, in every area, 21st century literacies. So that as you progress toward high school and as you go into college and, and pursue your careers, you are fully prepared and that you know how to dig into content and to understand material that maybe might be a little new to you. But it doesn't matter if it's new, you'll know how to approach it because you'll be fully immersed in 21st century literacies. So that has been a focus area of mine. I know that some people call that kind of back to basics, but some basic things are essential and some basic things are important for us to emphasize. And so we are continuing that focus because it's working for us. We know that we just got some pretty good news um, from our Maryland State Report Card in terms of 90% of our schools getting at least three out of five stars. And so that's good for Baltimore County Public Schools. <laughs> we know that we still have work to do and we know that we're not satisfied. It's not time for us to be satisfied or complacent. So we need to make sure that you're working as hard as you can. And on our side, our educators and our staff members, we're working as hard as we can to fully prepare you. So climate is another piece that we are focused on so that when you come to school, you feel welcomed, you feel supported, you feel safe, and especially in middle school because many times in middle school, I know middle school can be a little challenging sometimes when it comes to friendships, relationships, shade, you know, <laughs> right? Roasting, mm, you didn't think I knew that. Right, I have girls at home too. Right, so all of that can, can plays into the dynamic, particularly at middle school, but throughout our county. You know that it's happening even in elementary school sometimes. That's where it kind of starts. And so we don't want someone to quote unquote throw shade or to roast. Those who are roasting may think it's funny. Those who are being roasted, not so much, right? So no one should feel put upon, nobody should feel intimidated or threatened. And so we're putting a lot of emphasis on how we can wrap our arms around every kid so that you feel like you have a place you can come to every day and where you can learn and feel comfortable and safe in your environment. 
because that's important for us to be able to have you get to school safely and where you feel safe and supported and that you have a place where you can learn and grow every day. So we want you to have somebody to talk to if you need to. We want you to have somebody you can reach out to. And we want you to have avenues that if you don't feel like you can talk to somebody, that you can get somebody's attention to help you. So that has been our focus and our emphasis over the past year and a half to make sure that you are immersed in 21st century literacies and that you have a school climate that you can be proud of. So that's a little bit about where we are as a school system, but you didn't come here just to hear me talk to you, right? Go on and on and on. You came here so that you can ask some questions, give your good suggestions, tell us what we're doing right, and so that we can have a, a dialogue and conversation. So we're going to get started, okay? Ready? All right, so who would like to ask the first question? Oh, lots of hands up on this side. We'll start on this side and then we're, we'll alternate sides. So yes, let's start right here. Yes, and tell us your so, name and your school. My name is Isaac Ronzik and I go to Pikesville Middle. Okay. I was wondering why we changed from the regular BCPS format to the Schoology format. Okay, good question, good question. Thank you for your question. You know, it takes a lot of courage to ask a question and to, to put your, um, your position out there. So we want to encourage each other as we're asking these questions. So let's keep in mind, so last year, remember when we had under, behind BCPS1, so if we pull back the curtain of BCPS1, the machine that ran that before was N-grade. Many of you remember N-grade, right? And now the machine that's running that is called Schoology. And when we met with our... Um, teachers and parents and I had various kind of town hall meetings and community meetings before and they said that our other system was good and that it, it worked and it gave us a lot of good information but it wasn't as flexible as we needed it to be it was kind of you know clunky at times for a big organization like ours and so they asked us to find to move to one that would be a little more flexible and that would give us information and so that was the decision was made then to go to Schoology so that we could, for a, uh, an organization as large as ours, that we would have some that would be more flexible. So that was some of the decision making going into that. We know that some of the features that we had before are really good features that we want to incorporate into our new one, it, our new system as well. So for instance, I've already heard that in terms of getting your grades in a snapshot, that we need to be able to see that. Getting your uh, QPA, your GPA um, in a snapshot it was helpful before and you want it back again. I see a lot of heads nodding. So we're working with them to see if we can do that so that we have a system that works for us, that works for everybody. And those features we can certainly try to build in. Good question, good job. <laughs> this side, yes. My name is Tamara Harris. What made you decide to be the superintendent of BCPS? <laughs> How are you going to help students perform better academically? That's a good question, very good question. So let's start with the first one in terms of the decision. You know, my decision was really to become a teacher. That was my main decision. And that, that decision was made about 27 years ago. And I still consider myself to be a teacher. That was my main decision because this this, for me, has been about you. That's what this decision has been about. This decision is about you and how I can teach you in a way that fully prepares you. And it sounds so cliche to say that children are our future, but guess what? You are. And so we have to make sure that you are fully prepared. So that has been my mission along the way. Sometimes. I've had to be nudged to take on the next thing, but I'm always grateful that I did because if I can have the influence in order to, so along the way, it's about greater and greater influence so that the teaching, your, your preparation, and my ideas about how to fully prepare you make, makes a difference. So that's the first part of your question. In terms of academic achievement, that's always right up there in terms of top priorities achievement and your safety, right? Because if you're not safe, the achievement piece is not going to happen. So we have to make sure that you're safe. 
But in terms of the achievement, we get there by making sure that we're staying focused on what's important in terms of your achievement. Those 21st century literacies that I talked about, that's critically important so that you have to know every single one of our students, every single one of you has to make sure that you're engaged, that you have an uh, ability to ask questions where you need to, that you can see projects through from the beginning to the end, that there are projects that you're working on that mean something. That's how you learn, that's how you grow. So student achievement is paramount. And so we're, our teachers are working every single day to make sure that that's the number one goal. So thank you for your question. This side. Um, right here. Hi, I'm Amelia Bowen. I go to Cockeysville Middle School, and I was wondering, um, like, why our bathrooms like seem to be like not very good. I guess like the kind of disgusting and not very well managed. I guess. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's a really good question because we take when you you consider something like bathrooms, you think, well, it's just a bathroom. It's not just a bathroom. It's about how you feel when you're in school. Everybody wants a clean, safe, comfortable environment. And that doesn't matter if you're in the cafeteria or if you're in the bathroom or if you're in the library. You need to make sure that you have a clean and safe environment. So there are lots of things that go into that. One, system-wide, when it comes to our maintenance plan, if we have fixtures in bathrooms that we know that need to be replaced, that goes into that. If we have an emergency that something just springs a leak, in a bathroom that we didn't expect, we have a team to try to help with that. Then the general day-to-day, -day, we have amazing custodial staff too, who work with us to make sure that they're keeping our bathrooms and our school facilities clean. But we also need you to do the same. It's those things that you learn at home, those things, you know, like pick up behind yourselves, throw the paper towels in the trash can. If you miss, pick it up and put it in the trash can. Right? I know I sound like a mother because I am. <laughs> but you know, those same principles that we learn at home, we also need to carry over into school. And then hold your friends accountable, too. So when you see that they miss the trash can and it hits the floor, just say, no, go get that. Pick that up. Because it takes all of us. It takes every single one of you. It takes our custodial staff. And it takes us centrally to make sure that we're investing in our buildings to maintain them so that when we build them, building them, that's just one part. Maintaining them is equally as important. Good question, good question. <laughs> this side, this side, yes. Yep. Oh, <laughs> I'll come to you next, okay. I'm, I'm Mo Gehring McCoy from Hereford Middle. I have two questions. Sure. Why did you buy computers when you could have used the money for schools that don't have air conditioning? Okay, good question. Let's give her a hand for that question. <laughs> so this is not an either or question. Thank you, you can have a seat, that's good. This is not an either or question. And so when it comes to making sure that kids have the resources that they need, you can't say, well, you're gonna just have resources or have air conditioning because you can have air conditioning without the proper tools that you need then then you don't have what you need inside that that building we want all of our buildings to be comfortable we want all of our students to be able to learn in a comfortable environment but we also need those resources that will help enhance the instructional environment and enhance your learning opportunities it's not an either or it's about how to be responsible with funds in a way that we can provide both, that we can have comfortable environment for schools and we have a way to invest so that you can compose information and receive it. It's not just about a device. We have lots of tools. We have lots of instructional resources that you need access to, that our teachers need access to. Our teachers need choices as well to when they're instructing you. Sometimes you might have 28 students in your classroom, right? You might have 28 kids in your classroom, and as a teacher, I need to be able to push out assignments to you that you can sometimes work on on your own. Sometimes I need to be able to pull you in a small group where I can work with you 
Sometimes I need to be able to work with you individually. Sometimes I need to be able to push work to you that you can work on individually. So as a teacher, I need all of those various options because my job as a teacher then is complex. I have kids that are learning at a various rates and at a different pace. And so I need to be able to meet those needs, but I only have two hands and there's only one of me as the classroom teacher. So I need resources that I can call upon and that I can invest in and that I can use so that I can meet the needs of all of our learners because everybody learns at a different rate or pace. But that doesn't mean that we stop working to make sure that our facilities are comfortable. Good question. <laughs> this side, this side. Um, let's see, right there in the back. Striped shirt. There you go. My name is um, Aya Iola, and I'm a seventh grader at Franklin Middle. And I want to know um, the classrooms, they're very dirty. And there's a lot of, now that um, December's coming around and the winter holiday's coming around, um, the spread of bacteria and disease is very high, mm -hmm. and a lot of desks and a lot of uh, rooms are not properly cleaned by the mm -hmm. maintenance staff. And it's allowing disease and uh, different illnesses to spread. So is there anything that you could do to um, mm -hmm. help clean up our classrooms? Yeah, thank you for your question. Good question. <laughs> Having clean facilities, that's the standard. That is, that's our basic standard. That's our basic expectation, to make sure that we have clean and safe facilities. That's our basic and our most minimum standard. You deserve that. You deserve to have a clean and safe facility. So we'll take a look at your specific uh, case, but I have to say that a lot of people make it a lot of investment of time and energy to make sure that you have just that. As we look around here, we're in a clean and safe facility, and we need to make sure that every single one of our classrooms in our schools has the benefit of the same. So if we see that, this is where your voice matters. You each have the benefit of a student council, right? Your school student council representatives are there to be your voice. So when you see things like that, whether or not it's your classrooms or your bathroom or your various kinds of things that you want something done about this, make sure, how many of you are student council members and representatives? You have a powerful job. You are your representatives, right? You are the representatives for your schools. It is impossible for me to touch base with 114,000 students, but I do so through those of you who are student council members. So you can be that voice to your administrators, you can be the voice to me specifically, so that if something's not happening, something's not going well, you have a voice to be able to get some things done. Good point, good question, thank you. This side, which school hasn't had a chance yet? Okay, yes ma'am. <laughs> my name is Samaria Rice, I go to Southwest Academy. And my question is, even though we have counselors, but do all BCPS staff, as in teachers, or just as in people in general, look at all different perspectives? Like when something goes wrong in a classroom or at home, and if we don't have this assignment, then they look at it as, oh, you're unprepared, I taught you this. But we all have to look at different perspectives, and, and you know where I'm coming from. And I put myself in your shoes, so do we all look at different perspectives? Yeah, good question, good question. What you're talking about is social emotional learning and making sure that, again, we call those wraparound services. So that you, it's hard, let me give you just a little lesson in, in a term called pedagogy, right? So a pedagogue is someone who not only teaches you academics, but a pedagogue also wraps his or her arms around you so that they care for your entire well-being. That's where the word pedagogy comes from. And so for those of us who are involved in K-12 to education, we're pedagogues. We are those who make sure that we're caring for your whole being. To care for your whole being means to understand it, to know your story. Every child has a story. And so without knowing your story, I may not know all that you're up against. And so it's important for us, and I know that our teachers are very invested in this. That's why they ask you questions. You know, I just in the, in the high school session, we talked about how many, um, how many kids are open 
to talking to their counselors and talking to their teachers. I need you to be open to talking to your teachers and your counselors. Your, your teachers and counselors are not just trying to get in your business, <laughs> right? They're just trying to get in your business. They're just trying to understand your story, to know how to teach you best, to know what you need, to know, well, maybe you're struggling with this. Maybe you're struggling with housing security. Maybe you have some food insecurities where you're not quite sure where dinner's going to come from tonight. Maybe there are other kinds of things that are going on. We need to know your story and account for that. So we're doing a lot of work with social emotional learning. As a matter of fact, I created a whole division of uh, school climate and safety. And in that, and I see Dr. Martin Knox in the back, she's in charge of that division where social emotional learning is number one and where we're looking at how we can provide those wraparound services as pedagogues who care about the health and well-being of every kid. Good question. <laughs> yes, me. My name is Amaya Archer. I'm from Deer Park Middle Magnet. How do you guys understand, help us understand Common Core math and comprehend if you guys never taught us our parents that math? <laughs> Good question. Good question. <laughs> and so there's a, there's a video. Some math, you know, things are just basic. I just saw a video recently of a toddler. I don't know if many of you saw that. And she's arguing with her father about how to count to five. Did anybody see this? And the, the toddler, she she's looks like she's about three years old, and she says, no, Mommy, it's one, two, three, five. And the father says, no, it's one, two, three, four, five. She says, no, it's one, two, three, five. And so they go back and forth, and they argue back and forth. It is the cutest thing. But sometimes you guys do that, too, for some of the basics of math, even with, no, that's not how it was taught. You don't understand. You don't understand this math. Math is math, and there is a basic method of math. But what we've known about now about the standards of math is that math can be a little complex and that there are various ways to come to the same answer. And so we need a varying kind of abilities to be able to go at it so that you understand the why underneath the mathematics, the conce concepts of mathematics, not just the, 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 the algorithm itself and how to solve it. We don't want you just to remember the rhymes and remember the kind of the formulas, but we want you to know why you're learning what you're learning so that it'll apply to other math. When I was growing up, it was ours is not to reason why, just invert and multiply right? Well, you have to understand why you have to invert and multiply so that you can apply that principle to other mathematic, uh, <coughs> mathematics concepts. So that's why sometimes for those who are in my generation, we kind of learn those sayings and those phrases. That's okay. They're still good. But those things, the, that's the basics of mathematics. The math hasn't changed. So we need to know that and understand the math why. In terms of where, what we're doing with mathematics system-wide, though, it's important to know, we are looking at a math audit. And have, I've called for a math audit to see how we can make our curriculum even better and even stronger based on what the college and workforce requires now of students to make sure that we're fully aligned with those expectations and thinking about our sequence of courses and when we offer which courses to which students. So that's an excellent question. We are taking a close look at that, but it makes sure that you're open to your parents helping you too, uh, because sometimes I know the kids are saying, nope, I don't want your help, but make sure that we're open to that because math is math. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> Has your school had a chance yet? No. Okay, right here. What led Baltimore County to the ultimate decision to remove auditions from Magnet Middle Schools? Okay, good question, good question. So when it comes to magnet um, schools, we know that our, at the high school level, there are auditions and there are, there's a kind of a whole entrance criteria for in the application process. There's an application process for the middle schools, but in 2013, Baltimore County conducted a magnet audit through Medicine Associates and had community meetings throughout. And a couple of things emerged from that, that one, we needed to make sure that we had access to magnet programs for kids throughout the county. So no matter where you live, we should be able to have certain 
you know, every kid be able to access a program. So that if there's a dance program at um, Patapsco, that there's also a dance program on the west side of town, so that it's not limiting. One, another thing that came into that was that it seemed that only our gifted learners were able to get into the middle school magnet programs. And so the parents and the teachers and those who invested in that audit said, that's not fair to an average learner, an average kid who's 10, 11 years old, maybe who hasn't found their way yet, a 10 and 11 year old student should have an opportunity to explore options. To should they be an expert yet in dance or should they be an expert in culinary or should they be an expert? What about the average kid who maybe doesn't stand a chance if they haven't had that opportunity? So that's, that, the, that collective decision went into the lottery kind of process for a middle school magnet. However, at the high school level, by that time, you've had an opportunity to explore, you've had an opportunity to grow, you've had an opportunity to dig a little deeper and become a little more expert. And that's why there are auditions and a, a more stringent application process at the high school level. So you still have to audition for high school. So thank you for your question. <laughs> Who hasn't had a chance, which school hasn't had a chance yet? Windsor Mill, Windsor Mill. okay, go right ahead. Um, my name is my name is Melvin Machado, I go to Windsor Mill Middle, and my question is, why are some kids forced to learn like uh, geometry when like in some jobs they won't need it? Okay, good question. That is a question since the beginning of time, right? Usually it's algebra that I hear, right? So, and I see all the teachers kind of nodding. So believe it or not, so again, there are multiple ways to answer your question. One, yes, you will need it, um, and so it two, you need to make sure that you are meeting the standards of what it means to have your diploma mean something. So whether or not, and it's, it's, it's whether or not you are graduating in Baltimore and in, or in Maryland or if you're graduating in Utah, when you hold up your diploma, you are saying that I have met the standard and that I am qualified regardless of where I have been educated. And so there are some basic principles that every learner n needs and deserves. And in terms of algebraic concepts, geometric concepts, those concepts play in to many of the industries that you're going to pursue. You're going to have to find the missing variables. You're going to have to find, make some, pr do some problem solving through some geometric concepts, even regardless of the path you take. So you may not think so now, but it will come in handy, and when you do need it, it will be there for you because you would have met the standard. Good question. I'm coming back to you. I haven't forgotten you. In the back. Okay. Yep. There. I'm Abby Tartle from Arbutus Middle School, and I, I, was, I was hearing about lengthening the school day by 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and I was wondering um, how would lengthening the school day be beneficial to students when by the end of the school day currently already students are pretty much non-focused? <laughs> Thank you for your question. Good question. So believe it or not, Baltimore County has the shortest school day in the state of Maryland. Yep. We have the shortest school day. And because we have the shortest school day, it gets in the way of certain things. So many times when we, now we only have just a few kind of snow days or not enough time in terms of professional development days for your teachers. So that's very limiting because we don't have those extra hours. And I know that even this weekend, I believe they're calling for a little snow, but let's not, let's not conjure that up. <laughs> but, so it makes our decision very, very difficult because we want to have you in school as, as, and, and, and engaged in instruction as much as we can. When it comes to the school day, there has been a school day task force that has specifically looked at the benefit of whether or not we should lengthen the school day so that we do have more flexibility in terms of inclement weather days, professional development days for our teachers, and so we're not so limited. And most in, excuse me, most importantly, to have that additional instructional time for you. 
many times we're looking at how that, that time will benefit you in terms of the social emotional learning that we just talked about, thinking about how it might play into additional activity time that you might have, but more importantly, your academic time as well. So I know that at the end of the day, you know, you feel tired and you feel a little exhausted. And, but so we're looking at, does the, does the benefit outweigh some of those cons of you being tired? So we wanna make sure that you have a program that's not overwhelming, but one that gives you a full instructional program and that allows us a little more flexibility. Good question, very good. <laughs> this side, oh, I'm sorry, I did promise you, come on, right here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Becky Crumbacker and I go to Franklin Middle School. Mm -hmm. um, I have more of a suggestion than a question. Sure. Um, I admire how you bring life lessons into curriculums and uh, s studies mm -hmm. and schools. And I feel like if we did that a little bit more, then kids would be more interested in their lessons and they would feel like they need that in their future. Thank you for that. Good suggestion. <laughs> that, is, that is our goal, ultimately, that you have those real life experiences that are baked into the curriculum that our teachers can access for you so that you are really problem solving. You know, it's, it's interesting when you ask the college recruiters now what they're looking for. They're looking for a few things. They're looking to see if your courses are getting progressively more rigorous so that as you progress through high school, they don't want to see that you're falling off, right, and that you're making an easier schedule for yourself. They want to see that are you progressing, getting that more rigorous. But they also want to know that you're participating in courses and in and instruction that makes you problem solve, where you have to show your creativity. My, my daughters are, you know, I have one in college and I have one who's on her way. And so those college recruiters are asking her and asking them, what do you bring to the table in terms of your creativity? And so that's why in the curriculum, we have to make sure that we have those opportunities for you to be creative, for you to work on projects with other people and so where you can learn those problem solving. You can also learn what it means to collaborate and how you can distribute the work. How many of you have been in a, engaged in a project and it seems like you're the one doing all the work? Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. So that's not fair. So how do you then confront without being confrontational and work with your group to say, this is how we're going to distribute our work. That's, those are leadership school skills that you need. And this is how we're going to get it done. Get it done in a timely fashion and not give up on it. And this is how we can be creative in the, in the process. Great, great suggestion. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yep. My name is Evan Wasser, Hi, and Evan. I go to Catonsville Middle. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that our buses are extremely overcrowded mm. to the point where we have students either squished up against a window or sitting in the aisle. Mm -hmm. And we think part of the reason is that space hasn't been accounted for. Mm. And I'm wondering, are you willing to open that up? Yep. If we have to get a new bus, it's expensive, but are you willing to do that? Because we have a serious safety issue. Thank you for your question. I love your courage. So every parent, when I send my children out in the day, every parent sends their kids out to school. There are certain things that are basic for every parent. And I don't care who the parent is or where the parent is. Every parent wants to know when I send my kid out of the door, whether or not that kid is walking, being driven, taking the bus, or driving themselves, you want to make sure that your kids are getting to school safely and on time, and getting home safely on time. Ultimately, you want your kids to walk back in the door, and they want, you want them to have had a productive day, and starting that day off by making sure that you're getting to school on time. And so we don't want any bus to be overcrowded. Now we know that there are things that shift during the year. And so it's really at this point in time in the year, we would have to take a look to see if those buses are still overcrowded. We know that in the beginning of the year, for instance, there are more kids who ride the bus, especially our seniors who might be riding the bus. Once they get their driver's licenses, then they choose not to ride the bus, but they would still owe them a seat. If you're noticing that your bus is still overcrowded, then yes, and let me just say for the record,
that we are opening up our whole transportation um, department to look closely at just those kinds of things. Which buses are overcrowded? Which buses might be consistently late? Which buses are not getting kids home on time? Keep in mind that we do have 808 buses on the road every day. We transport 81,000 kids twice a day. That's a lot, right? And so 99% of the time, it seems that we're getting it all right. Some things we can't, we have to account for, some things that we can't control. Traffic, we can't control. If there's an accident, we can't control that. If sometimes your friends are bringing their instruments on the bus <laughs> and it's kind of taking up a seat and we didn't plan for that, right, then it feels a little more overcrowded than what it is and we, we didn't necessarily plan for that. But then once it's on, on underway, and we certainly by this time of year should know by now, then we do have to make those adjustments. And where we need to add a bus, we need to. And where we need to have another bus driver, we need to do that too. So I'm more than willing to do that. Great question. Good job. Yes, sir. Yep. Hi, my name is Ruben Daniele, and Hi, I go Ruben. to Pikesville Middle. I have three things, and one of them is a recommendation, and two of them are questions. Okay. My first recommendation is that you should have teachers encourage more extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. I feel like extracurricular activities give students a bit more purpose outside of school. While in school, they're usually completing their work, and that's like their job in the classroom, but outside of school they might not know exactly what they might want to do with their time, and I feel like extracurricular activities could really help with that. Like, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're like all county bands, but they're not really like supported so much, they're not really advertised, they're only really advertised to the honor students that can get in, but I feel like there sh people should be open to getting into those at lower levels. Mm -hmm. Um, my first question is, what is your plan going over the short term and the long term to better engage students in the classroom? Mm -hmm. And my second question is, why do we have programs like AVID or similar programs like that that prepare students for college by teaching them personal management skills mm -hmm. when the classes that we already have should be teaching us those mm -hmm. skills? I think a good example would be math. It's not only supposed to teach us the mathematical principles, but it's also supposed to teach us critical thinking mm -hmm. and how to think about those mathematical principles. Why are we only learning those mathematical principles in class and we have to do that personal thinking at home or in a different class even uh, in reflection rather than just doing it in that class as part of the class? Okay, good points. <laughs> Excellent points. I do think you had about six questions in there, but I'm just, uh, so let's see if I can remember it all. Let's start back with the extracurricular activities because I do think that that's important. The extracurricular activities are not just activities for activity's sake. I think you make an uh, important point. For me, when I was taking kind of a modern dance class after school and part of those clubs, it helped me stay connected to school. Those are the things that I, that I enjoyed and that helped me stay connected. And we know that the connectedness um, factors and really important to the climate and how you feel about school. And if you have something that you feel connected to, it's important to keep you engaged. Besides that, think about the nature of extracurricular activities, about the teamwork that happens or the perseverance that you need to show up for your, uh, your band or your music class you know, after school. Think about all of the, the kinds of things that you do collectively as a group. Those are skills, those are life skills that you'll need. So we're trying everything that we can to expand those opportunities for kids because that's exactly how you stay connected. In terms of your, the AVID piece that you talked about, those skills are great for every kid, right? So you're talking about the study skills, the organizational skills. AVID specifically addresses though, maybe students who, who struggle in those areas and maybe who didn't have the advantage of having their parents sometimes who could teach them some of those skills. Or maybe they didn't have the benefit of that. So we take kids, particularly those who didn't have those experiences or those who may have struggled and we offer a specialized program for them. But let's be clear, those strategies are effective strategies no matter what you're pursuing and should be the case throughout. What was your third point? Yes, 
Yep, so again, that has to do with the teaching and learning piece in terms of the student engagement piece. That is the expectation. Sometimes, in terms of how we're writing curriculum, how your teachers will deliver that instruction, sometimes you're going to work in a small group, sometimes you're going to work on your device, sometimes you're going to work paper pencil, based on your learning style, based on what you need. And so those options have to be available to you and that's where student engagement comes in. The brain research tells us that the more that you're engaged, the better you'll be able to process learning. If you're confronted with something that's brand new to you right now, your tendency is to lean over and ask to talk about it with somebody else, right? Not everybody, but most of us want to lean in. That engagement piece is critical and it's a great suggestion. Good question. Good job. All the way in the back. And I'll come back up front, I promise. Hi, my name is Azul. Um, I go to Northwest Academy. And this is like a suggestion, sure. not a question. Okay. But I understand that we need like resources for education, but we also need proper nutrition for education. Sometimes our school will serve the same things every day, like pizza and fries and milk. But sometimes we like students can't learn off of that. Students need a proper nutrition for it because they would serve the same thing every day. It's not brain food. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really help us learn because food will help us learn, like breakfast and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I just think that we need proper, if we can afford these devices, then we can also afford, afford the proper nutrition for education. Good point. Good point. <laughs> nutrition cannot be underestimated. And so I completely hear your point about the options that need to be available um, to students. and. Just recently, I know that our team looked at all of the 10 um, requirements, actually, for schools to offer so that we can offer those healthy options um, in our schools and that kids will have a balance and that they're not just having pizza and fries, for instance, but that they have healthy options as well. And if you notice, if we go to high school, you'll see even those healthy options in some of the uh, vending machines, too. So it's important for us to have a balance. Nutrition overall, though, is so important. And so we know that many of our students didn't, don't have the benefit of um, adequate nutrition throughout their day. One of the things that we've done this year for, for kids who qualify, not just um, for free meals, but many kids, maybe income is limited at home. And that happens. And maybe they qualified for reduced priced meals. Many, many, uh, it may be that some of you qualify for reduced priced meals. We're able to then offer now, this year, have our kids who are eligible for reduced priced meals receive their meals for free. And we're, we've done that so that we can maintain that child's dignity Nobody has to know. When you go to get your lunch, what do you do? You punch in your PIN number, right? So we're able to maintain your dignity and make sure that you have the proper nutrition as well. So I think that your point is a good one. Many times we, we're focusing on the academics, but we also need to focus on that nutritional side as well, which we're doing as a school system. Good job. Thank you. I'm Kaminsky from Franklin Middle School, and uh, thank you for everything you've done for Baltimore County. And um, I was just wondering, how is the activities in our classroom working to like promote personal identity of each student? Okay, tell me more. Tell me more. Ask like, me um, a little bit more. Like knowing what they want to be, like oh, their okay. future, and also like supporting. Yep. like having support and st like individual stuff like that. Good question, good question. So don't take your um, inventories lightly, like Naviance, for instance, right? Don't take that lightly. That tells you a lot about what you might want to pursue. That's the whole point of it. So that you're ex while you're exploring options, while you're trying to figure out life, there are a lot of us who are 50 trying to figure out life, right? So you're, so you're trying to make sure that you have some idea of the avenues that you would like to pursue. So when you take an inventory like Naviance, don't just take it and say, well, um, you know, I'm just taking it just to take it. 
think, take it seriously so that when you get the results back, you have some options and it can give you some idea of what your pathway might look like based on your interest. Things that not necessarily make you happy because happiness is fleeting and goes here and there, but in terms of things that give you joy and fulfillment and a sense of purpose where you're realizing your purpose. And thank you for the compliment, by the way. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. My name is Kyle Moses, and I was um, gonna say, who inspired you to become a, a superintendent of BCPS, and what did you have to do to prepare for the role of a superintendent? Very good question. <laughs> well, I think that my inspiration, and it's a really good question, has come from various sources. So when it comes to the teachers who made a difference in my life, and who really inspired me to go into teaching. And those were my teachers, really beginning at the elementary level thinking about the principals and the teachers who I looked up to and admired, Kim Whitehead, Evelyn Chapman, the rest who I can name them, who I looked at them and I thought, they are, they really care about me. That, right? So you know a teacher who can teach well, but you know those who really care about you. And so when I saw that they really care about me and they're really good at what they do, that if initially inspired me. And then I've had people along the way to kind of nudge me to say, you know what, you're not too shabby at this leadership thing too, so you should try that. And even when I'm hesitant, you have to be open to those types of opportunities. In terms of preparation, you should always prepare yourself because you never know what opportunities will come your way. And you want to be able to take advantage of those opportunities when they, come, when they present themselves to you. And so, when, or when it's your time to pursue your purpose, you want to be fully prepared. So along the way, you learn, you study, you grow. And for those of us who are, are educators in particular, but throughout your lives, regardless of the, the profession you pursue, you should be a continuous learner. Be committed to learning more, asking those hard questions, and learning more about, about perfecting your craft. That's what it takes, not only to be superintendent, but just to be good at whatever it is that you choose to pursue. I know that you're already on your way, Kyle. Mm. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which school haven't we gotten to yet? Let's see. Okay, right there in the back. I'm Colin Ashby from Lansdowne Middle School, Hi. and I would like to know what's wrong with map testing, because I did the language arts map testing yeah, when it came time to do the math map testing, mm -hmm. nothing came. Yep. So what's the Good problem? Good question. With it? I'm glad that you asked. I'm glad that you asked. Good question. <laughs> so yeah, we asked the same question, by the way, right? So we wanted to know. And what happened was, you know how sometimes when you're at home and you might have some Wi-Fi issues, you might have some connectivity issues. The same thing happened with us when sometimes we some schools had connectivity, some schools didn't. And so it took us a little bit of time to work that out. And there were various reasons, little tweaks and adjustments when we transitioned over that we needed to make sure that we had full connectivity across the system. So we've worked with everybody, we've worked that out now, but it did take us some time and that got in the way of the map testing. But thank you for asking the question, good question. Yes, sir. My name is Jeffrey Martin, and Jeffrey. I need to ask these three questions. Okay. First, can you summarize what you've done in Baltimore County in three main factors? The second one, what can you like do to help in help us with college and career readiness? Mm -hmm. And number three, what can you say that has influenced you during your time as a Baltimore County Superintendent? Okay, thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Jeffrey, Jeffrey, you need to be a reporter. <laughs> okay. So a couple of things. Let's start with your first question in terms of what has gotten done. We're really fortunate, and I'm fortunate to have such a wonderful team. And when I say team, I mean all of the educators, all the staff members who work with me to get these things done. And we've gotten a lot done. So let me just start with the various things that we've gotten done. We were able to get, for instance, a budget passed that would benefit you directly. So in terms of all of the various people 
that we were able to get. And it's not just about getting people, it's about getting the right people. So in terms of getting more teachers, more special educators, more counselors, more PPWs, more psychologists for you. Because I know how to, I don't know how to do everything well, but I do know how to teach reading, I know how to teach math, I know how to guide and direct, but I don't know how to do that without the people. So we were able to do that. We were able to make academic performance and achievement, so able to grow you academically, which is very important, and we were able to restructure our system in a way that makes sense for greater efficiency so that we can be fiscally responsible and so that we can provide direct support and service to schools. So that's for your first question. What was your second question? No. Okay, so in terms of preparing myself and making sure that um, I have a vision for the school system, you have to make sure that you're graduating and I have to make sure that you're able to graduate with a diploma and a resume. So that, and you know what a resume is, right? In terms of making sure that when you leave us, a diploma is what you're supposed to have. My mother would call that your reasonable service our reasonable service, right? You're supposed to be able to graduate with a diploma, but what else will give you a leg up on the, comp uh, on the competition? You're going to compete with kids from all over the globe for college acceptance. You're going to compete with them for jobs. You're going to compete with lots of different people. And so when you're competing with them, I want you to have an advantage. And that advantage is there should be multiple pathways that you take. I want you to have some college credits under your belt. I want you to make sure that you might have be proficient in a second language. Maybe you have an industry credential when you graduate. You might be ready to pursue a job as soon as you walk across the stage. Maybe you're involved in a, in a dual enrollment kind of program where you have that benefit. So I want you to have that advantage. That is my long-term goal, that you are graduating not only with a diploma, but also a resume. Now I'm getting the wrap up sign in the back so I know that we're going to have to come to a close. No worries though, I will be here to hang back if you have some additional questions for me because I'm here for you and I'm here with you today. So we have some time um, even though we have to, to end this part of the, the program. I am so proud of you. I am so proud of the questions that you're asking. Continue to ask those questions. Continue to do the very best that you can Continue to nudge your friends so that when you see that something is not necessarily going well, that you encourage them and that you live by example. And again, I'm proud of the work that you're doing and I'm proud of each and every one of you. Thank you for being with me this afternoon. All right.